Well, let's go over to Galatians 4 tonight. And I know that we, have, uh, we had been in a series entitled Ministering and Receiving Healing. And of course, we're going to uh, uh, continue at uh, different intervals ministering on healing and, and bringing our supply to the body of Christ. But there's some things the Lord's been talking to me about to minister on. And uh, we want to begin uh, tonight to minister on this subject of purposes of prayer. And uh, uh, with the subtopic of the praying Christian. Purposes of prayer, the praying Christian. I've never seen a time, and, and I want to be very nice when I say this, I've never seen a time in my life in the body of Christ where more nothing has been being said than right now. And I, and I mean, I'm not being ugly, but I, I just, I just, I, I see so many believers that need things to change in their life, and I hear so much being said, and the only, the only response I can have is, what are they saying? And I'm not critical of anybody, uh, because I, I have my own vineyard that I've got to take care of. But uh, we want to look at these things concerning prayer, and... Uh, this is important, and, and we'll deal some with the intercession tonight, the principles of intercession. But the Lord said to me some years ago, He said, prayer is the lungs of the Christian life. And prayer is to your spirit as oxygen is to your body. Uh, we breathe in oxygen, we breathe out carbon monoxide, and plants take in carbon monoxide and produce oxygen that we breathe out. We breathe out prayer and God receives our prayers and in turn produces answers. All right? Prayer is laying hold of God's willingness. It's laying hold of God's willingness. And... Uh, in Galatians 4.19, we see the beginning of the principles of intercession. The principles of intercession. And we're going to deal with uh, a number of things tonight. And uh, from the scripture, in Galatians 4.19, Paul is praying here for the church at Galatia. And we dealt with this in a message, uh, well, it would have been year before last, we just took every Wednesday night and taught verse by verse through Galatians. And Paul says here in verse 19, My little children of whom I travail in birth again until Christ be formed in you. So he, we begin here with the principles of intercession. And, and there are three principles for, for, of intercession. Number one is praying for the lost. Uh, interceding for the lost. Number two is standing in the gap for people and places. All right, praying for the lost. Number two, standing in the gap for people and places. And then the third principle of intercession is working with God. All right, so praying for the lost, standing in the gap for people and places, and then thirdly, working with God. All right, these are three, the three principles of intercession. Hallelujah. Now, in 1 Timothy chapter 2, we see a very familiar scripture. And 1 Timothy 2 and verse 1, Paul says, I exhort or I desire therefore that first of all, supplication, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men. Well, all the, there, there are four different types of prayer mentioned here in verse 1. Supplications. Prayers, intercessions, giving of thanks. Those are all types of prayer. Now we'll deal specifically with intercession tonight. But notice he says that intercessions, giving of thanks be made for, first of all, all men. Second of all, for kings. Third, for all that are in authority. And here's the result, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who will have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. 
Now, partially why I'm, I'm ministering on this and starting this series is because of a lot of the imbalance that I see. And, and uh, I learned years ago that there's a ditch on the right side and a ditch on the left side, and the answer's in the middle. All right? You don't ever want to be out of balance. God is not extreme. All right? God's balanced. God has a balanced approach to things. And what I see a lot of is, is there's extremes. You have one side that says, oh, it's over. God's done with America. Ship our saddle home. It's finished. You know, there's nothing we can do about it. And then on the other side, we have people that are just throwing their hands up and going, well, whatever, que sera, sera. You know, as, 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 as long as my paycheck isn't hindered and my family's okay, you know, hey, whatever. Well, both those approaches are wrong. And, and, and they're wrong because of the authority and the power God's given the church. All right, they're, they're wrong because of that reason. So he says that intercessions are to be made for all men. For all men. Uh, obviously, political leaders are included here, but it's not limited to political leaders. All right, he says, he, he mentions kings and all that are in authority, but he starts off by saying, for all men, that intercessions, prayers, supplications, giving of thanks are to be made for all men. It's our job to intercede. It's God's job to change the people or the person. All right, now, obviously, we just, obviously, last year, November, uh, you know, we had a lot of turmoil, a lot of, Topsy-turvy times. And, uh, you know, I've had people ask me, they would say, uh, well, why do you think that happened? Well, I can tell you. Because a lot of the church did this. Concerning the election, they prayed the prayer of faith and prayed it one time and never prayed again. The prayer of faith can be used for things that are ours right now. Healing. Infilling of the Holy Spirit. Prosperity. Things that I need right now. You cannot ever just pray the prayer of faith one time about the political landscape of a nation or the political landscape of a country and leave it at that. And so, so what happened in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a lot of, of people's lives, I'm not saying you, but what happened to a lot of believers, and, and they talked to me, they personally said this to me. Well, you know, uh, it's been declared, so it's going to happen. And what happened is we had a lot of people that were saying things, and I'm not saying they didn't hear from God. That's not my place. But here's what I'm saying. We had a lot of people that were declaring this is how it's going to go. This is the direction it's going to go. Victory is ours. Don't worry about it. We got this. And they might have been right voices. I'm not saying they weren't. But here's what it did to a lot of people. It dumbed them down and they quit praying. And they quit praying. Because there are things, as I said, you can pray the prayer of faith for once and that's the end of it. But there are other things you can't pray the prayer of faith on. Right? That's why Paul talks here in, in verse 1 that there's times I have to pray, I have to supplicate. There are times I have to be giving thanks and praying other types of prayer. And that's for everybody, for men, all men and kings and all that are in authority. All right? So, so I'm not just interceding. I'm not just praying the prayer of faith. I'm not just supplicating. I, I've got to discern by the Holy Spirit what type of prayer is needed for the certain situation that I'm dealing with? Amen. And, and pray in line with that. Amen. Do you see this? It reminds me, uh, Brother Hagin told, uh, I say told a story, it, it was a story. In 1970, uh, he was seeking the Lord and he said that, that he saw come up out of the Atlantic Ocean these three frogs, three big frogs. And he said they, they, they came up on the shore and they began to, to, to move throughout the earth. And the Lord told him uh, those three things that uh, they were, uh, I want to make sure I get them right, that they were uh, upheaval in the social structure, activity of the devil in the political scene, and a disruption in the financial scene. 
All right? And he made mention specifically that there was an issue that was going to occur with the president. Well, you remember what happened along about that time. Little, little infamous incident called Watergate. Right? With Tricky Dick. I'm not a crook. I'm not saying he was. I'm just, you know. That's not what I'm saying. But here's, here's the point. Here's the point. God forewarned the church. Now, in 1979, they were at the, the yearly camp meeting in Tulsa, and they went up to a, a hotel room of, of, of uh, uh, Pastor Hagen, Ken Jr., to, to have some fellowship and, and, and refreshments. And a spirit of prayer came on Brother Hagen again, and they began to pray, and they ended up praying till like 8 in the morning uh, from all night. And the Lord showed, this was 1979, and the Lord showed him these three things. He said in a vision, I saw these three frogs coming up out of the Atlantic Ocean. Now, don't make a doctrine out of the Atlantic Ocean. There's no Atlantic Ocean doctrine. All right? That, you understand? All the way through the Bible, that's just indicative of people groups. All right? And, and that, that these spirits were going to operate in the people. And it was pretty much the same thing. Social upheaval, financial upheaval, and there was an issue that was going to happen with the president. And the Lord spoke to him, and he said, the church has to pray. He said, because in 1970, the church could have got out ahead of that, and they didn't do their job. And he said, I am going to hold the church responsible for what didn't happen in 1970. He said, I'm, he said, I'm not going to hold the man that was in power responsible. I'm going to hold the church responsible. And he said, when you tell people in my church that, many of them are going to laugh. And he said, but they won't be laughing when they stand before me on the judgment day and I hold them accountable. Now, I'm not being that strong with you. That's what the Lord told him. But in 1979, they got out ahead of that. Well, what happened with our president in, in, in that year? He, there was an assassination attempt on his life. But God spared him. Amen. What, what are we seeing in the nation today? Social upheaval. A threat about the financial standing in our, in, our, in our nation. And political upheaval. Have you ever seen more of a politically up, uh, uh, tumultuous time than right now? I never have. I'm not as old as some of you, but I've never seen it. Amen. I've never seen a social upheaval like we're experiencing right now. Amen. And here's what I see too many of the church doing, giving up. Right? And, and you've got people over in the corner. Even so, come quickly, Lord Jesus. Well, He's coming. Amen. But He's not coming after a church that's underground and hiding. He's coming for a church that's glorious and full of power and doing exploits. Amen. That's not how the church is going out. The church is not going out with a whimper. We're going out with a bang. Amen. Are you following me? And so, I, I say that to say, I don't want you to ever think that God's done with America as a nation. Now, I know we have some problems. We have issues. But here's the thing. There's still an entity in America that can turn things. It's the church. It's the church. Amen. This nation still funds somewhere near 90% of the gospel to the world. Are you following me? This is important. Look at Ezekiel 22. Oh, hallelujah. I told my wife the things that the Lord was talking to me about. And uh, I said, you know, I, I, I am always accused of being an eternal optimist. But, you know, when I, when I read the Word of God and I see what the Word of God has to say, <laughs> I, saw, I see some very dark situations in the Word of God changed and turned. When, when people got serious about the things of God. Amen. Ezekiel 22, verse 30. It says, 
And I sought for a man among them that should make up the hedge and stand in the gap before me for the land, that I should not destroy it, but I found none. Therefore I poured out my indignation upon them. I consumed them with the fire of my wrath. Their own way have I recompensed upon their heads, saith uh, the Lord God. Notice, God here is talking about an entire nation. And what did He say? I'm looking, I was looking for a man to stand in the gap and make up the hedge for the nation. Somebody that would stand in the gap. Somebody that would, somebody that would make a way for me to move. Amen. God can only intervene as Christians ask Him to move. And when you've got groups of Christians that are saying, well, God's done with America and, you know, we're, we're, we're reaping the harvest of, of the seeds that we've sown. Well, listen, I, I understand that there's doors that open in, in nations where sin is concerned, and I'm not, I'm not debunking that. But here's what I'm saying. As believers, with, the Bible says in the book of Ezekiel as well that he has put watchmen on the walls and he said, I'm going to hold the watchman accountable if he sees the evil coming and doesn't do anything about it. Well, we're the watchmen on the walls. We, we, are, we are the group, amen, we're, we're the group that stood up at the midnight hour in the parable of the five virgins, the five wise and the five foolish. We're the ones that stood up and said, hey, the bridegroom is coming. Amen. Amen. Do you understand? We're the bridal party. We're the ones that are announcing Jesus is about to return. Amen. We can do something about this. Oh, hallelujah. Amen. Because listen, if we couldn't, God shouldn't have put it in the Bible. Are you following me? So God can only intervene as Christians ask Him to move. So God is looking for someone to stand in the gap before Him for the land. For the land. And here's the thing. All that God will hold me responsible for is my part. He's not going to hold me responsible for somebody else's part. Just my part. What's my part? Stand in the gap, make up the hedge, intercede for the land. Stand in the gap, make up the hedge, intercede for the land. Amen. Don't, don't, don't get your words involved in destruction. I've, I've preached on this for the last few weeks. What adds faith value? Listen, I, I understand that we can have some ungodly elements in, in politics. But one thing that I did not read in, in, in uh, 1 Timothy chapter 2 is run them down, ostracize them, talk about them, and call them ugly things. I didn't hear that. Amen. If, if you can't pray anything else, you're praying, Lord, save them. Lord, send somebody to share the gospel with them. Lord, sh- send somebody to shine the light. Because that's, that's what we need. We, we need the gospel being shined. Do, do, do people, are, do they believe things that we don't agree with? Of course they do. They, they believe ungodly, sinful things. But here's the thing. I never see anywhere in the Word where any, any of the apostles, Paul, Peter, and they, they never called them. Paul said, Paul and Peter both said this. It said, you need to be wary of speaking igno- ig- uh, evil of dignitaries. Because it said they don't bear the sword in vain. The powers that be, they be of God. Whatever office that you're praying for, that office is ordained by God. It may be occupied by by an ungodly, sinful person, but the office is ordained by God. And I'm praying as a man submitted under authority to that office. And, and, And when I submit under the authority of that office then I have a legal standing to intercede for that nation. I don't have a legal standing to intercede in rebellion. I only have a legal standing to intercede when I'm in submission to the office. Hallelujah. Amen. And that doesn't mean we don't call wrong wrong and we don't call sin sin. Hallelujah. Oh, glory. Oh, thank you, Lord. Colossians 4.12 And uh, it says, 
Paul, speaking of Epaphras, says, Epaphras, who is one of you, a servant of Christ, saluteth you, always laboring or striving fervently for you in prayers. For what purpose? That you might stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. So Epaphras is standing in prayer for all the church at Colossus, that they would stand complete or filled perfect and filled in all the will of God. There will always be those that need our help to stand in the will of God. Always. Because there are things we can get for people when they don't know or are not even inclined towards the things of God. I talked about it Sunday night, about stocking the shelves, making tremendous power available. Amen. There, there, there's, there's wisdom, there's power that needs to be made available. God is revealing some things uh, uh, new and fresh into the body of Christ about authority in the days that we're living in. And when men and women of God begin to understand their standing at the throne of grace and they begin to take their place, they, we can begin to make things happen. All right? We can begin to make things happen. The Lord has shown me over and over again, and this is just the way it, it has been shown to me, is, is the thinness of the political system in, in America. And, and I've just seen it. It's really thin. And, and I kept saying, Lord, what do you mean by that? Because, because I, I, I tell people that, even people I have great respect for, and they just kind of look at me like, well, praise the Lord. You know? But this is what it is. It can't stand up under the pressure of a praying church. It just can't. It can't stand up because it's not strong enough. Anything built on deception, according to the Word of God in the book of Proverbs, it says the lying tongue is but for a moment. Anything that's built on deception is momentary. It's temporary. It's fleeting. I, I don't know what God's going to do in the sense of, I don't know what if He's going to expose something. I don't know. He, we got to stay focused on our job. Folks, hear my heart when I say this. You need to quit looking for one prophetic word that's just going to absolutely blow things out of the water and we need to get back to the heavy lifting of prayer and intercede for our nation and make tremendous power available. That's what, that's what we have to do. That's what we have to do. Amen. I, I was watching one dear brother the other night and, and again, I'm, I'm, I'm not critical, but I don't use something that I didn't hear myself. And... and uh, he, he's of the prophetic bent, and, and he was talking about all these things that God had told him, and, and, and then using all these natural signs to prove that he was hearing from God. But the more I listened, the more I thought, what does that have to do with anything? What does that have to do with anything? You know, snakes and rods and pools and I don't know, weasels I think was even in it. Now, now I realize prophets can be a little different, but, but here's, here's, here's the point. Here's the point. When we get down to business and we begin to pray, the forces of darkness cannot withstand the power of the interceding church. Just can't. Amen. You know, you, you've read this before in the book of Acts. It says that uh, 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 Herod reached out his hand and vexed some of the church. And he killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. And because he saw that it pleased the Jews, he took Peter and put him in prison, intending to bring him out on Easter and kill him. But the very next line says, But prayer was made unceasingly for him by the church. Is that right? Now, you know, sometimes, I don't know if people think about this. What did we lose when we lost James? We'll never know. Because the revelation he could have brought, we, never, we don't know. Now the indication there is that the church didn't get behind James like they got behind Peter. They dropped the ball with James. They picked it up with Peter. Amen. And what did they do? They made tremendous power available for Peter in the form of an angelic rescue. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And, and he was delivered. And because he was delivered, we have all the revelation that Peter could bring into the body of Christ. And so 
There are times you may intercede for somebody that's unable to pray for themselves. And it's not just because they're incapacitated. It could be a novice believer that doesn't know how to pray effectively. But I'm called to intercede for them. I, I may have told the story Sunday night, but I'll tell it again. I'm reminded of the, the, the time that Brother Hagin said his Sunday school superintendent was working on top of the tool shed in the oil field. And he fell off the tool shed and fell down into the, into the motor that was driving that, uh, that equipment. And uh, by the time the doctor got there and uh, they called and told Brother Hagin that th they thought the guy had died. And so he went to the location and, and he knelt down there by the doctor. And the doctor said, whispered to him and said, you know, he's almost dead. He said, I, I don't even want to move him because I think it would kill him. Well, the man's wife showed up and, and he said, uh, Brother Hagin, Reverend Hagin, would you take her over and prepare her for this? And Brother Hagin said, I took her by the arm and took her to the side, not to prepare her, but to, 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 to get together. And he said, we, we got over there. And uh, he said, the wife of the man looked at him and said, Brother Hagin, I know that the doctor thinks that, that he's not going to make it. And he said, yeah, that's right. And she said, but isn't it good we have inside information? And he said, yes, it is. It's, it's good that we have inside information. And, and Brother Hagin said, we do have inside information and he'll live. Well, they, they eventually moved him to the hospital and she would stay up there all day and Brother Hagin would stay up there all night. And he said, I would sit there in the room and pray. But he said, of course, I'd been up for three nights. And he said, I would get tired and I'd doze off. And when I would doze off, he'd start dying. And he said, and I'd wake up. And, and he said, when I would wake up, I would go out in the hallway and I'd walk and just pray quietly. And I would remind the Lord. He said, here's what he said. He said, I would plead his case because he couldn't plead his case. I would plead his case. And he said, remember what he said? He said, I told him, Lord, this is the best Sunday school superintendent I've ever had. Said, he may not be the best one in the world, but he's the best one I've ever had. You know, he visits people. He takes his own time, goes visits. He gives 30% of his income into the church. Lord, I need him. Hallelujah. I need him. And, 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 and uh, uh, after he had prayed that way for a number of nights, a number of hours, the doctor came in to it was the next morning to check the man and, and, he, and he pulled the oxygen tent up and checked him out and he said, my God, he said, he's come out of it. He said, we can take him to x-ray and, and find out everything that's wrong. Well, they took him to x-ray and, and a few weeks later, the man was back in church testifying and he said a couple things that I, that I think will bless you. He said to the church, number one, he said, uh, don't ever feel sorry for a believer that dies. He, sa he said, because he said there was no pain. There was no pain. He said, I fell into that machinery and there was no pain. Amen. He said, I fell into that machinery and the next thing I knew I was with Jesus. And he said, I was standing there talking to Jesus and Jesus said, you can't stay. You got to go back. And he said, but I don't want to go back. He said, you've got to go back. And he said, why? He said, because Brother Hagin won't let you stay. Now, this is that man's testimony. He didn't know Brother Hagin had been praying that way. This is his testimony. And he said that what he saw was that Jesus turned and pulled like what looked like a lace curtain back, and he could see Brother Hagin in the hospital corridor praying, God, he can't die. I won't let him die. What was he doing? He was interceding for somebody that didn't have the capacity to do it for themselves. Amen. You can't just pray the prayer of faith in that circumstance. Lord, heal him. He, he's dying. Amen. Oh, glory. Our job's to be the voice that God asks us to be. Our job's to be the voice that God asks us to be. And the purpose for intercession is that God needs someone to stand in the gap for the land or for the person. That's, that's the purpose for it. That's, that's, that's the reason for it. Now, uh, of course, in, in recent times, everything, people call everything intercession. They say, we're going to have intercessory prayer. Well, maybe. Or you might have supplicating prayer. Or you might have prayer of thanksgiving. I don't know that we're just going to come together and intercede. But here, here's the point. When, when we're talking about intercession, think about this for a moment. Someone that cannot, know, does not know how to pray effectively or unable to pray for themselves. Now, that's not just somebody that's sick. That's an unbelieving leader. They don't know they need to pray. They don't know they need God. Amen. But we can, we can pray doors open. Amen. You know, we believe that about our loved ones. 
Lord, set events in motion today whereby my children will hear the gospel and turn their lives to Christ. What if we prayed that way for our leaders? Lord, set events in motion today whereby my governor will hear the gospel and turn his life to Christ. Or whatever, the senators, the congressmen, the president, whoever. Amen. See, because what, what happens is the church gets so dumbed down because of goofiness that we lose our power. And we get sidetracked by all kinds of fruitless doctrine. Amen. I heard somebody the other day talking about how we were entering into the season of Pentecost. And, uh, uh, you know, Pentecost on the Jewish calendar. And that Pentecost was not an experience or a denomination. You know, it was, it was a, a, a gathering time that God ordained. And that it ought to be on the church's calendar too. L- let me explain something to you. Pentecost should not be on the church's calendar. And I'll tell you why Pentecost shouldn't be on the church's calendar. It's a feast that was done away with in Christ. Got quiet. If you ask the nominal believer, why should we celebrate Pentecost? They have no idea. And people say, well, you know, but the Holy Spirit was poured out on the day of Pentecost. Do do you know there's a real good explanation for why? There's a real good explanation for why. What other feast day could God get Jews, unbelieving, unsaved Jews, from all over the world to Jerusalem? To hear the gospel and be saved and fill with the Holy Ghost. Except on the Feast of Pentecost. There was, there, there was such a, 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 a vast number of, 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 of uh, Jews that showed up that needed to hear the gospel. That in one meeting, you remember one meeting, 3,000 were born again. That was Holy Ghost oriented. That was Holy Ghost put together. Amen. Isn't it interesting that throughout the Pauline epistles, you never see the church celebrating feast days. You never see it. Matter of fact, you see Paul writing, I read it again this morning, where Paul said, he said, he said, don't let anybody bring you into bondage over new moons, Sabbaths, feast days. He said, you're not in bondage to that. Now, if you want to celebrate it, that's between you and God and your business. But, but I'm telling you, it, be, it becomes a sidetrack, it becomes a distraction, and it moves the church away from their real purpose. You and I will never be Jews. We will never be Jewish. We're the redeemed. And, and in Christ, what the Bible say through Paul? In Christ, there's neither Jew nor Greek, male or female, bond or free. Is is that what he said? Amen. Now why is that important? Because the church gets sidetracked. They get distracted over pet doctrines and, 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 and things that have no eternal significance. Amen. I've heard people say, well, you know, there's a feast that we're going to celebrate for eternity. No, there's not. No, there's not. It's not in the Bible. Amen. And and sometimes it takes a Ph.D. to mess the Bible up. And, 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 And I'm not against that. But you understand what I mean by that? The, 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 the bottom line is, is people say, well, you know, we'll celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles forever. No, we won't. No, we won't. The, the Bible talks, when, when the Bible talks about people coming to Jerusalem to celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles, it's in the thousand year millennial reign of Christ. That's before God has transferred His throne to the earth and set up the new city, the new Jerusalem on the earth. After, after that, why would we celebrate the feast when we are in the presence of the fulfillment of the feast? This is so important. And it gets the church away from their main job. The Bible says that we are salt and light in the earth. Is that right? We are salt and light in the earth. Well, think about this. You know, I... Uh, uh, all my all my people are from the south and except for my dad's people and and they were from ohio they were yankees uh, 
And, and that's where I was born, so I can't, I, I can't claim anything else. But the, the, the point is, is, you know, I, I remember, you know, you remember smoked ham? And, and I don't mean the kind that you go and, and buy in a package. You know, I mean the, the, the salted ham, smoked ham. You know, they'd hang it up in the, in, the, in the smokehouse. Well, you know, before refrigeration, salt preserved the ham. The Bible says we are the salt of the earth. You and me are preserving the earth. The, the earth has seen wicked times, maybe even more wicked than we're seeing right now. The earth has seen wicked times and the church always preserved it. I believe we're the, we're the preserving of the earth. Now one day we're going to be out of here. And if you, if you think it's wicked now, wait till we're not here. You don't want to be here. So if you're not saved, get saved. So you can go with us. Amen. Amen. But we're the salt of the earth. We're the light of the world. And Jesus says if the salt has lost its savor, it's good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. How does the church lose its saltiness? How does it lose its savor? By getting distracted, getting pulled over into other things that we have no business being involved with. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. And I'm not just picking on people that, that preach feast days. I, that, that, that's, I don't care what you believe about that. But I'm telling you, it becomes a distraction. It becomes an issue where we, we lose the main thing that God told us to do. Amen. Glory to God. Uh, Genesis 18 and verse 17. I hope I'm helping you. Genesis 18. And verse 17. And the Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham the thing that I do, seeing that Abraham will surely become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth will be blessed in him? I know him that he will command his children and his household after him, and they shall keep the way of the Lord to do justice, judgment, that the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which he hath spoken of him. And the Lord said, because of the cry of Sodom and Gomorrah is great, and because their sin is grievous, I will go down now and see whether they have done altogether according to the cry of it, which has come unto me, and if not, I will know. The cry, the cry of Sodom and Gomorrah, the, the heaviness is what that means. The heaviness of their sin. Because of the heaviness of their sin. And he said, I will go down, Judicial investigation is what that means. I will go down and investigate and see. Now, now understand, God knew. But, so, so think about that for a moment. Why would he come down and investigate? Because he's investigating because there's a chance. You know, God doesn't have to investigate something because he doesn't know. Right? Right? And he says, I'm going to go investigate this. He went down to investigate whether or not he could save the city. He was looking for a reason to save them. I hear people saying, God's done, God's done, God's done. God's always looking for a reason to save. Can I tell you something? God can't be done with any nation because we're still in the day of grace. We're still in the day of grace. I don't care what nation it is. There's a chance to turn. How do I know that? Because if you'll, rem if you'll remember this, this story, uh, uh, Ahab had killed Naboth. Him and Jezebel had killed Naboth. And if you'll remember, after he found out that Naboth was dead, he got up and went to the vineyard. That's pretty cold-blooded. Murder a guy and then go check out his grapes. Right? And, and think nothing about it. And the Bible says that God sent Elijah and talked to him and, and told him what he had done. And he said because of this, God, he told him about all the destruction and, and the judgment that was come on Israel and to come on him and his house. And it says that Ahab, Ahab, and just before that, it says there was no king before or after Ahab that sold himself to do wickedness in the sight of God like him. Before him or after him. 
And it says, this king, this wicked king, went home and put on sackcloth and ashes and went softly before the Lord. And it says, the word of the Lord came to Elijah and said, see how he humbles himself before me. Because of this, I won't bring it in his day, I'll bring it in his son's day. That was Ahab. And when he humbled himself, and was, and was willing to go softly before the Lord, God said, okay, judgment's not coming in His day. I'm not trying to just avoid judgment for me. I've got family members that need to be saved. I've got, I've got friends that need to be saved. You've got family members and friends that need to come to Jesus. We don't need to write our nation off. We don't need to throw our hands up and give up. We need to pray. We need to intercede because God can still change things. God can still change things. Amen. Oh, glory. Now notice, amen. Hallelujah. We train them up right. <laughs> now you remember the story. Abraham is interceding. And he's interceding for the city. Now, and I want you to see that. Verse 26. He said, Will you slay the righteous with the wicked? Shall not the judge of all the earth do right? And the Lord said, If I find in Sodom 50 righteous, I'll spare the city for their sakes. I'll spare the city. Not just the righteous. Mm. Do, do you see that? The Bible says, the Bible says that when Joseph was sold into slavery... That when his brothers came to him, you'll remember at the end of, of all the tests that Joseph put him through, Joseph said, what you meant for evil, God meant for good. God, God didn't mean the imprisonment and all that for good. It, you sold me into slavery and you meant it to bring evil on me. God meant it for it to turn out good. And he said what? He said, to save many people alive. The Bible says that Joseph... Is a, is a type and a shadow of Christ, sold into slavery, sold into the hands of, of, of evil and wicked men. But he went into that place of slavery and death and subjection to save many people alive. Listen, God is concerned about people. Egypt was not a godly nation. Egypt was not a God-fearing nation. But because there was a God-fearing man that would stand in the gap and make godly decisions, God spared that nation. Well, the way God has done is the way God will do. God doesn't change. Do you see this? He said, I don't change. I change not. Hallelujah. That's important. Because Ecclesiastes says, the thing that has been is the thing that will be again. See, you've got to believe what the Bible says. Judgment cannot be poured out on our nation until we're gone. Amen. Either we believe that or we don't. Now, I'm not telling you that there's not sin in our nation. I'm not even telling you that in, for the most part that this is a godly nation. What I'm telling you is God isn't done with us. And there's things we can change. We, we don't write off anything. Amen. Oh, hallelujah. Abraham's intercession was not just for the righteous, but the entire city. The entire city. Amen. You know, all it takes in a family is one person that will pray. That's all it takes. And, and, and here's the thing. You may not even see all the fruit of your labor. You might die before everybody gets saved. But your prayers never leave the earth. Jesus, <laughs> Jesus told Peter before he ever ascended to the Father. He said, Peter, Satan has desired to have you that he may sift you as wheat. He said, but I prayed for you. And when you are strengthened, how do you know he was going to be strengthened? Well, he was Jesus. No, that's not why. Because he had prayed for him. 
I prayed for you and when you're strengthened, I prayed that you'll be strengthened so you will be strengthened. And when, I, I, when you're strengthened, encourage your brethren. Amen. If you're, if you're praying for children, for grandchildren, for cousins, whoever you're praying for, you take your place of intercession and you're not moved by what you see or what the circumstances are. And if you go to heaven before they get saved, your prayers are still in the earth. The promise of the Word of God is still in the earth and you will still see the redemption of your family. Hallelujah. Amen. And, and, and when people, it bothers me when people start giving up. Amen. I, I, I've talked to people that, well, I just don't know. I, I think our finest days are behind us. Well, you know, define what you mean by that. Amen. I don't believe that God puts churches in cities for no reason. I don't believe that. He's got us here for a purpose. There is a place. God, God gives us the opportunity for intercession so He can reveal His mercy and His righteousness. God wants to show mercy and righteousness. To nations. I mean, listen, think about this. If God was going to destroy nations... Why hasn't he destroyed Iran? They hate the Jews. And God said in his word, anybody that's your enemy is my enemy. And if they persecute you, I'll fight for you. Why hasn't he destroyed them? They need to be saved. There's people there that need to be saved. He's given everybody the opportunity. That's what the Bible says, that he's patient. He's waiting on the precious fruit of the earth to come in. Amen. He, he's not just waiting for a great revival and then he can just pull everybody out of here. The revival is not about the church. The revival is about the world. The church should be alive. The church should be full of power and miracles and signs and wonders. It's the church that's reaching the world. It's the church that saw and lightened the world. And that's not just your moral beliefs. That's the power of God that we possess. That's the answer to our prayers. People in our neighborhood should know you go there and you Go to that church and your prayers will get answered. And God will touch your family. Amen. Oh, glory. It's always important to be able to connect myself to what I see in the Word. What do I see in the Word? I've got to connect myself to that. God wants to show His mercy and His righteousness to the people on the earth. Hallelujah. There's a... Amen. There are more, now notice he went all the way down in verse 32 to 10. He said, if there's 10, I will not destroy it for 10's sake. There are more than 10 righteous in America. There's more than 10 righteous here tonight. That's important to me. Because God cannot change. He cannot change. And so if we take our stand and we take our place and intercede for the nation, for the state, for the city, hallelujah. Do, do you see that? I've, I've watched this over and over again. And you know, there are people that would say things like that are just happenstance. But you know, I don't know, you know, when I send my child to school, I don't know what other, if other parents are praying. I hope they are. She goes to a Christian school. I hope they pray. But I don't know. And, and even then, I don't know how they pray. So I take my position. And I tell the Lord, I'm standing for my, my child's school. I'm standing for every child in that school in the name of Jesus. And I'm declaring over that school, every disease, germ, and virus that touches that school dies instantly in Jesus' name. Every, every one. Amen. Why? The Bible says the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much, makes tremendous power available. They don't have to believe in healing for sickness not to touch them. Amen. 
And God is my witness. I got the email the other day. They've had no cases. They've had no sickness in that school all year. Now that's not pointing the finger at me. That's a righteous man taking his place at the throne of grace and saying, I have righteous seed that goes to that school. And because the seed of a tither is in that school, destruction cannot come on that school. Amen. And, and that's got to be your mindset. Your neighbors should be very grateful that you live where you live. Because that entire neighborhood is kept by the power of God because you're there. Hallelujah. Because I'm taking my place. Amen. Hallelujah. So there are more than 10 righteous in America. And God can change things if we take our place. And we can't overreact. The church is the most overreactionary force in the world. You know, I'm. <laughs> the, the, listen, there are certain bills, legislation that's up in Senate and Congress. And, and folks, listen, it's, it's diabolical. And, and you can't get around that. But what do we do about it? We pray, we intercede. Amen. We, we, pray, we pray for people to have a backbone, to stand up for what's right. Amen. Because what, what the Bible say? It said, if, if the foundations, if the righteous are removed, what, what can the city do? What can, what can the nation do? Hallelujah. And, and we need to stand in the gap and declare an end to partisan politics. And Father, bring a spirit of unity to the House of Congress and the, the House of Representatives. Lord, bring unity to them. Let them cross over, over political lines and party lines. And I've had people say, oh, you really think that can happen? How much faith do you have in your prayer? you got to have more faith in your prayer than you, than, the, than, than you do in party affiliation. The Bible says the heart of the king is in the hand of the Lord and he turns it whithersoever he wants. Amen. Hallelujah. And I'm not talking about everybody becoming a Republican. I'm talking about godly rule winning. That that ungodly legislation be put down. And we can't do it out of fear. I, I, I hear a lot of ministers saying, oh, if, if that passes, uh, uh, you know, they'll take away our tax exemption. Well, what does that mean? You're going to quit preaching because you're not tax exempt? I don't get it. That's a great perk. But what's it got to do with getting people saved? It's one of our freedoms. I understand that. And I want to keep it. I'm not saying it's a bad thing. But we're never, we're never going to win the fight in fear. Oh, glory to God. To have the depth that God desires in our church life, our church, our life, our ministry, we have to intercede. And intercession is not the most important type of prayer. The most important type of prayer is the type that's needed at the time. But God will begin to speak to the church. You know, let me, let me close with this. The voices that you need to be listening to right now are the voices that have been trusted to produce balance and longevity. The voices that you need to be listening to right now are the voices that, that have results that are proven in your life. Amen. Because, because it's, listen, we got, we got prophecy a million going on right now. I mean, every, every day there's a new prophecy. Every day. I mean, people I never even heard of. And, and, and they're all over YouTube. Urgent prophecy warning. Urgency this. Ur, urgent this. Folks, if it's extreme, watch it. 
if, if, it's, if it's all about symbolism, watch it. Stay with those voices. The Bible, the Bible says, if you stay with your... The Lord told me years ago, He said, if you stay with your fathers, you'll stay safe. That's what He told me. And I've never forgotten that. I've never forgotten that. Amen. And so, what we want to leave here with tonight is this understanding that where the righteous are, the power of the king is. And this is not just about protecting us. This, this, this is about what Joseph said, preserving much people alive. You know, I've heard people say things, and, and I don't disagree, but I think the church is picking up on too much of this. Well, you know, if this passes and that passes, America as we know it will be done. Well, is that what we want? We, we can't just lay down and let it happen. Amen. Yeah, but I feel like I'm fighting uphill. Well, keep fighting. You got on shoes of peace with, with long cleats on the bottom of them. You're prepared. Maybe you students, you remember Dress to Kill. They, the, that, that soldier had on those, 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 those shoes of peace. That was designed for fighting uphill and designed for fighting in rough, rough territory. We're clothed in the armor of God. Amen. Amen. We, have right, we have standing at the throne of God. And there's nothing wicked men can do that we can't change. Because we have standing at the throne of God. Hallelujah. And so that, that's our goal. That's our plan. That's, that's what God wants to do. Amen. I believe that's what God wants to do. And we're just, we're just not going to give up. Hallelujah. Let's stand up, shall we? Praise the Lord. Thank you for being here. It is one hour and five minutes of power. Amen. Of course, if you can join us tomorrow at 1030, we're going to have a prayer meeting here at 1030 in the morning. Uh, we'll be praying at 1030 for at least the next six months and uh, just believing God for some wonderful things. God's good to us. Amen. And then, of course, Sunday morning, Pastor Michelle will be ministering on Sunday night. And I believe that God will minister to you. We had a tremendous healing school Tuesday. Uh, the, the power of God. I, I, I know that uh, many of you were touched by the power of God. And uh, uh, we're getting reports of people getting healed already. And so we, we believe God that He's going to continue to do that. Amen. And uh, God's, God's good to us. Praise God. Well, come on, say it with me tonight, would you? The vision of this church is to build people's faith. And frame their world by the word of God. And you and I will always be world changers. God bless you. Thank you for joining us for this message. We would love to hear from you. If you have a prayer request or want to share how this message has helped you, send us an email at main at buildfaith.net. This message and many more materials are available to you free of charge, can be found at buildfaith.net or at any of our location media stores. As always, keep the switch of faith turned on and build your faith and frame your world by the Word of God.